Hello, fellow students of history. This lecture concerns World War I. Um, World War I should be given a whole year of lectures. There's so much happening during this, this great event in history. Um, but this lecture concerns a, a few major points and a, a couple of um, original sources from the, view, the soldiers' um, viewpoint. It's now been a year since I've stepped foot in a classroom um, as we endure this quarantine. And I hope this video finds you in good health. And I want to encourage you to keep going. I know it's hard during this time to, to motivate yourself, um, to get up in the morning, to set your own schedule, but the end, of the, the end is in sight. And perhaps you're watching this video years from now or if the year, a year after the quarantine. But at this moment, while I'm giving this lecture, um, we're still under quarantine. And many of you are having a hard time. I empathize with you. I'd like to encourage you to reach out to friends and family um, over the phone or those who you live with, sit down and talk, call, call, call your friends on the phone. Um, and get out and walk, go to the park, run, walk, um, get out of the house and get some fresh air. Go to Yosemite, take a drive to Kings Canyon and see the giant sequoias and reach out and um, out of your, I know isolation can be very hard. So World War I, a war like no other, a war where science where second industrial revolution science comes together with belligerence to kill more people more efficiently um, with greater technology that really hadn't been seen since the Roman Empire. World War I. World War I, or the Great War, 1914 to 1918. US involvement in World War I 1917 to 1918. Here's a quote by President Woodrow Wilson, who saw the United States through World War I. Each nation must decide for itself how it will meet it. The choice we make for ourselves must be made with a moderation of counsel and a temperateness of judgment befitting our character and our motives as a nation. We must put excited feeling away. Our motive will not be revenge or the victorious assertion of the physical might of the nation, but only the vindication of right, of human right, of which we are only a single champion. Question. What was World War I? World War I was a European-based military conflict that started when Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist in June 1914. Due to tenuous peace agreements throughout Europe that held together nations with long-standing rivalries, within a week, of Archduke, Archduke Franz Ferdinand's assassination, Europe was embroiled in a continental-wide war. Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, but not before receiving assurances from Germany of an alliance. Russia backed Serbia, France backed Russia against the Austro-Hungarians in Germany, Great Britain and France allied with Russia. From the United States, most Americans and political leaders viewed the war as a European family-like dispute that did not and should not involve America. Why should American boys ship off to die for one big European family feud on another continent? For three whole years, from 1917, sorry, from 1914 to 1917, the United States managed to remain neutral and out, of, and out of the Great War. Yet, 
Growing German belligerents angered Americans until finally President Woodrow Wilson proposed war against Germany and Congress declared. World War I was far different, a far different war than any other military conflict since the beginning of human history. Science, this is very important since so you know, keep this in mind, science. Science and belligerence came together in ruthless efficacy, exponential technological growth during the second industrial revolution transformed warfare. More people were killed with greater efficiency and greater numbers and by far greater technologies. Advanced machine guns, airplanes and bombs and chemical warfare changed the rules and brought about carnage that the world has never had never witnessed before. Question, legacies and consequences, consequences of World War I. World War I ushered in a profound transformation of the American Republic from women in the workforce to advanced technologies on the battlefields to the creation of what would soon become the greatest military the world had ever seen. The introduction of the tank, airplanes, the machine gun, grenades, bombs, and chemical warfare made World War I a different type of war. A progressive nation on the poise of a new century went forward in incorporating science into the military forces in a way not seen since the Roman Empire. The horrific nature of chemical warfare led to the creation of the Geneva Convention agreements in 1925, restricting chemical and biological agents in the battlefields. Geneva Convention rules still govern modern warfare. One last major consequence of World War I concerns Germany. The victors in the Treaty of Versailles blamed Germany for the entire war and imposed a war debt on Germany that was both crippling and humiliating for the German people. Already suffering defeats and the loss of up to 3 million people, the wounded nation was forced to pay 132 billion marks or about 270 billion in today's currency. This is amazing. Germany made its final World War I payment on October 3rd, 2010. The unbearable burden of the Treaty of Versailles created the conditions for a savior figure, a messiah, to arise in Germany to make Germany great again, a slogan Hitler actually used as he seduced the German people. In a way, World War I was a threshold America walked through into the new century a century that eventually propelled the nation into the leading superpower on earth. The immediate causes of the European conflict. Here's an image of Archduke Franz Ferdinand being shot by a Serbian nationalist. One, on June 28th, 1914, this is the moment that ignites World War I, the catalyst. The assassination of Archduke Franz, Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary by a Serbian nationalist named Gavrilo Princip, who was part of a group who sought the end of Austria-Hungarian rule over Bosnia and Herzegovina. Alliances, imperialism, and militarism. Tensions had brewed for years in the Balkans. The stabilization of the region meant that already tenuous peace agreements could fracture, and they did. Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, Russia backed Serbia, Germany backed the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Great Britain backed both France and Russia. It's a little confusing, isn't it? Within a week, Russia, Belgium, France, Great Britain, and Serbia had lined up against Austria-Hungary and Germany and World War I 
had begun. Now keep in mind again, as we've already mentioned, it would take three years for the US to eventually be pulled into World War I. So for three years, um, war raged throughout Europe. Causes US involvement. These are the reasons why America, the United States of America entered World War I. May 1915, Germans sink the British ship RMS Lusitania, killing 123 Americans. Americans are outraged. Germany apologizes. January 1917, Germany begins targeting US ships in the Atlantic Ocean. Jan again in January 1917, the Zimmerman telegram, and we'll get to that in a moment. It both angered America and put a kind of fear and anxiety um, because of this letter that was sent from Germany to Mexico. And we'll read that in a moment. April 2nd, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson declares war on Germany. And the end. 11 a.m., November 11th, 1918, Germany signs the armistice ending World War I. And here is the telegram that was sent from Germany to Mexico City, but was intercepted by the British before, um, before Mex Mexico was able to read it. And what Germany tells Mexico is, if you enter the war on the side of Germany, when the war is over, we will give you uh, a great portion of those lands that were stolen by the United States in the war against Mexico, 1846, 18 to 1848. We know from our um, history 11, that at one time, California, Texas, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, parts of Colorado, parts of Oregon, um, were all at one time, that was a Mexican sovereign territory. But a westward expanding United States um, pushed westward by manifest destiny and, and the desire to um, incorporate both um, the Pacific seaboard and Atlantic into one great nation um, conquered um, half of Mexican sovereign territory. And that was 1846 to 1848. So what Germany is telling Mexico is enter on our side and we will give you back um, I'll read this, a, a great portion, not California, but Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona back. This is the final, this is the final straw for Woodrow Wilson and, um, and government officials in, in Washington. Um, this is Zimmerman telegram. It's sent by the German foreign office to the German ambassador in Mexico, but it's intercepted by British intelligence and decoded. One, it promised that if Mexico enters the war on Germany's side, all lands, actually not all, um, except for California, would be given back to Mexico. This angered Americans and helped persuade the nation to go to war. We intend to begin on the 1st of February, unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor in spite of this to keep the United States of America neutral. In the event, of this not succeeding, we make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together. Generous financial support and understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The settlement in detail is left to you. Now, this was a telegram that was, that was in code, as you see to the right here, and decoded by the British. We will inform the president of the above most secretly as soon as the outbreak of war with the United States of America is certain and add the suggestion that he should on his own initiative invite Japan to immediately immediate adherence at the same time mediate between Japan and ourselves. Please call the president's attention to the fact 
that the ruthless employment of our submarines now offers a prospect of compelling England in a few months to make peace. And this is the territory. Um, the red line signifies all that was once Mexico before, before 1846, when the United States, as it's going westward, um, before it conquered these territories. And the light green are those territories that Germany is promising to give back to Mexico once the war is over. And the dark green is modern Mexico. And Germany is promising to give back Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. And of course, this sent shockwaves throughout to Washington, D.C. And this was the final straw for Woodrow Wilson to declare war on Germany. Here is a division of Europe, um, the Central Powers versus the Allied Powers. The Central Powers included Austria-Hungary, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, as we see here, Germany, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire, which is now which now consists of Turkey and Syria, Lebanon. Um, Israel, right, and parts of Arab, Saudi Arabia. That one time was called the Ottoman Empire. Versus the Allied powers, Russia, France, the United Kingdom, Italy, Belgium, and in 1917, the United States of America. This is an interesting, a very fascinating insight into the mind and character of Woodrow Wilson. Frank Cobb, who was the editor of the New York World in confidence of President Wilson visits him on the eve of President Wilson giving um, the declaration of war speech to Congress. And I have four slides of this original um, eyewitness account of Frank Cobb um, talking, entering um, the president's study and writing about what he saw at that moment, the night, the night before. This is what Frank Cobb wrote. The night before Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war against Germany, he sent for me. I was late getting the message somehow and didn't reach the White House till about one o'clock in the morning. The old man was waiting for me sitting in his study with a typewriter on his table where he used to type his own messages. I'd never seen him so worn down. He looked as if he hadn't slept and said he hadn't. He said he was probably going before Congress the next day to ask for a declaration of war. And he'd never been so uncertain about anything in his life as about that decision. Four nights, he said, He'd been lying awake going over the whole situation, over the provocation given by Germany, over the probable feeling in the United States, over the consequences to the settlement and to the world at large if we entered the melee. He tapped some sheets before him and said that he had written a message and expected to go before Congress with it as it stood. He said he couldn't see any alternative, that he tried every way he knew to avoid war. I know, I think I know what war means, he said. And he added that if there were any possibility of avoiding war, he wanted to try it. What else can I do? He asked, is there anything else I can do? It would mean that we should lose our heads along with the rest and stop weighing right and wrong. It would mean that a majority of people in this hemisphere would go war mad, quit thinking, and devote their energies to destruction. The president said a declaration of war would mean that Germany would be beaten and so badly beaten that there would be a dictated peace, a victorious peace. It means, he said, an attempt to reconstruct a peacetime civilization with war standards. And at the end of the war, there will be no bystanders with sufficient power to influence the terms. There won't be any peace standards left to work with. 
there will only be war standards. Then he began to talk about the consequences to the United States. He had no illusions about the fashion in which we were likely to fight the war. He said, when a war, he said, when a war not going, it was just war. And there weren't two kinds of it. It required illiberalism at home to reinforce the men at the front. We couldn't fight Germany and maintain the ideals of government that all thinking men shared. He said, we would try it. It would be too much for us. Once lead this people into war, he said, and they'll forget there ever was such a thing as tolerance. To fight, you must be brutal and ruthless. And the spirit of ruthless brutality will enter into the very fiber of our national life, infecting Congress, the courts, the policeman on the beach, the man in the street. Conformity would be the only virtue, said the president. And every man who refused to conform would have to pay the penalty. So very wise words from this president, isn't it? He knows the consequences of going into this battle. How many thousands and thousands and thousands of young men will die? great weight on his shoulders. He thought the Constitution might not survive it, that free speech and the right of assembly would go. He said a nation couldn't put its strength into a war and keep its head level. It never done, it had never been done. If there's any alternative, for God's sake, let's take it, he exclaimed. Well, I couldn't see any and I told him so. The president didn't have any illusions about how he was going to come out of it either. He'd rather have done anything else than head of a military machine. All his instincts were against it. He foresaw too clearly the probable influence of a declaration of war on his own fortunes, the adulation certain to follow the certain victory, the derision and attack which would come from the def deflation of excessive hopes in the presence of world responsibility. But if, if he had to do it over again, he would take the same course. It was just a choice of evils. <sighs> Here are some stats. I don't want you to memorize these things, but just to, so you know. US battle deaths, around 54,000, 53,402, total number. Total number of US troops that served in the conflict, 4,734,000. We just, um, well, 53,000, that's a lot, of, a lot of American dead, isn't it? 53,000 young, mostly young boys. When I say boys, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, mostly around those ages. Around the ages that most of you who are listening to this lecture right now are in your life. Imagine going off to war in a foreign nation, dying in, in a muddy trench, with foot rot surrounded by rats crying for your mom. The grand total, including the US, if you look down at the left hand corner, 8,528,000 dead in World War I. Austria Hungary um, suffered over a million dead. France, over a million dead. Germany, around two million dead. Great Britain, nearly one million dead. Italy, around half a million dead. There's a lot of dead people. And it was essentially, at the beginning, a family feud. Many of the leaders who were um, in, in Europe at that time were grandchildren of Queen Victoria in England. Many of them were related to each other. And World War I in many ways was, a, was um, in opposition to what the vision of the founding fathers. And here's a quote from George Washington. 
It is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliance with any portion of the foreign worlds. George Washington had a vision for America that America wouldn't become involved in European affairs, that there would be trade alliances and common interests based on a shared culture, but not become embroiled in their, in their wars. Um, also Thomas Jefferson, as they write, here's a quote from Je Jefferson, peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. Again, his vision for, <coughs> for contact with Europe and the rest of the world would be peaceful, peaceful alliances, peaceful economic alliances, and not to be embroiled in any kind of military conflict. But technology advanced to a point where Wilson could no longer stay neutral because of Germany's belligerence. Uh, Wilson in America in 1914 was a vastly different America than the Americas, the, the, the America that George Washington and Thomas Jefferson created. It's a different world. Just as our world now, it's a vastly different world in a different America than Woodrow Wilson's America. Woodrow Wilson, the man, the president of the United States during World War I. He was a visionary, and many historians believe he was, he perhaps was too much of a visionary, too, too idealistic. Um, he was an academic, president of Princeton University, a PhD from Johns Hopkins University, 34th governor of New Jersey, a very intelligent man, a Virginian, he ran for office on states' rights platform, defender of, of the South. And, and um, he, he watched The Birth of a Nation. It was the first film that was screened in the White House. And he agreed with his with mes message. That's a different subject and different selection. Here are some excerpts from Wilson's war message to Congress. The next, this is the next day after um, the journalist editor visited Wilson in his office. So this is um, what Wilson says to Congress, the next, a few excerpts. It is a war against all nations. American ships have been sunk, American lives taken, in ways which it has stirred us very deeply to learn of. For the ships and people of other neutral and friendly nations have been sunk and overwhelmed in the waters in the same way. There has been no discrimination. The challenge is to all mankind. Each nation must decide for itself how it will meet it. The choice we make for ourselves must be made with a moderation of counsel you know, temperateness of judgment befitting our character and our motives as a nation. We must put away excited feeling. Our motive will not be revenge or the victorious assertion of the physical might of the nation, but only the vindication of right, of human right, of which we're only a single champion. We have borne with their present government through all these bitter months because of that friendship, exercising the patience and forbearance which would otherwise have been impossible. We shall happily still have an opportunity to prove that friendship in our daily attitude and actions toward the millions of men and women of German birth and native sympathy who live among us and share our life. And we shall be proud to prove it toward all who are in fact loyal to their neighbors and to the governments in the hour of tests. They are most of them as true and loyal Americans as if they had never known any other fealty or allegiance. They will be prompt to stand with us in rebuking 
and restraining the few who may be of different mind and purpose. If there should be disloyalty, it will be dealt with with a firm hand of stern re repression. But if it lifts its head at all, it will lift it only here and there and without continence, except from a lawless and malignant few. It is a distressing and oppressive duty, gentlemen of the Congress, which I have performed in thus addressing you. There are, it may be, many months of fiery trial and sacrifice ahead of us. It is a fearful thing to lead this great, peaceful people into war, into the most terrible and disastrous of all wars, civilization itself seeming to be in the balance. But the right is more precious than peace, and we shall fight for the things which we, we have always carried nearest our hearts, for democracy, for the right of those who submit to authority to have a voice in their own governments, for the rights and liberties of small nations, for a universal dominion of rights by such a concert of free peoples as shall bring peace and safety to all nations and make the world itself at last free. To such a task, we can de dedicate our lives and our fortunes, everything that we are and everything that we have with the pride of those who know that the day has come when America is privileged to spend her blood and her might for the principles that gave her birth and happiness and the peace which she has treasured. God helping her, she can do no other. You us at war. Chicago Daily Tribune. War. America is mobilized. It will never be the same again. We'll rise. Following World War II will become the superpower on Earth. Well, as uh, the United States vies with the Soviet Union and finally will emerge after the Cold War, that's another lecture, as the superpower. The Atlantic News Telegraph, United States now at war with Germany. Formal declaration made by Wilson at 1.13 p.m. today. And World War I was characterized by, uh, to a great extent, trench warfare. And you see this red line here. This is the main trench running from the North Sea down through France, down to mid, the mid-southern area of France. Hundreds of miles of trench warfare. The trenches were characterized by muddy, muddy trenches filled with rats and water and mud where soldiers stood for weeks, months, and sometimes um, flesh would rot off their, off their bones. A horrible existence surrounded by mud for miles during this war. World War I, when the Second Industrial Revolution goes to war. So these, the following slides are a few of the major technologies that were employed in World War I. And this, one of the, one of the major technologies was the Liberty Aircraft Engine. America's major technological contribution to World War I was a Liberty aircraft engine. It was light, powerful, and efficient. America's auto industry manufactured 20,000 of these things for the war effort. Amazing. America goes to war, manufactures 20,000 of these aircraft motors for the war. The aircraft, the first war to use airplanes Think about how that radically transformed warfare. Yet you're able to have aerial bombs and also dogfights between um, pilots in the air as machine guns, as technology advanced and machine guns were able to be placed up here and airplanes fought each other. The tank, the tank makes its, um, it comes on the scene in World War I. Uh, many of them break down, but they're introduced in World War I. And of course, by World War II, the tank is a, is a powerful tool 
um, in World War II. Here's a British Mark V tank. The Schneider CA-1, the first French tank. The Renault FT tanks operated by the US and Army in France. Light tanks with a crew of only two, these were mass produced during World War I. The US M1917 tank. The bolt action rifle, 15 rounds could be fired in one minute and a person 1400 meters away could be killed. The machine gun, the MG08, here's the German flag up here. The most powerful handheld or um, manned weapon in World War I, I believe. 500 rounds per minute for the Schloss 08 and 600 rounds per minute for the Schloss 16. Amazing, 600 rounds per minute. This is a far cry. Think about the Revolutionary War. So 1776, just a couple centuries later and you have this. 600 rounds per minute compared to the musket being fired by the revolutionaries. This is a this is very efficient killing. Science and belligerence come together in World War One. The second industrial the second industrial revolution goes to war. And of course, poison gas. The Germans are the first to create chemical warfare. And the first soldiers to, to see clouds of gas coming toward them didn't know what it was. They, they were confused. This is the first time that anyone ever see chemical warfare being used. And of course, those who first encounter it die because there's no, they're not prepared for it. Here are British troops blinded by poison gas during the Battle of Estar. I'm not very good at French. I know Estar, Estar, 1918. They're blinded. It's poor guys, poor young men. <laughs> British emplacement after German gas attack. These are all young Englishmen. Well, they, they could be Irish and Scots, but British, dead after a German gas attack. Horrific, horrific way to die. <sighs> Football team of British soldiers with gas masks, Western Fronts, 1916. So you got to have fun during your time on the, the trenches, like the trenches and the planes. We, we call it soccer. They call it football. They're playing with their, their masks on. British infantry advancing through gas at Luce, 1915. Italian dead after an, the Austrian gas attack on Mont Saint-Michel. What a horrible way to die. A Canadian soldier with mustard gas burns. Look at these large blisters on his wrist, under his underarms, on his neck. My God, that looks so horrifically painful. This poor young man. <sighs> Hard to look at. Can you feel that pain? Man. A painting, John Singer's Sergeants, 1918 painting, gassed. Here's an eyewitness account. Oh, sorry. Let me go back. Eyewitness account of a soldier 
Um, a, a, a GI. Well, he was an American fighting for the British. Arthur Empey from New Jersey. Enraged with the treatment of the U.S. at the hands of the Germans, Empey joined the British Army when the U.S. did not declare war with the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915. When this account took place, Empey was assigned to a British machine gun crew overlooking German trenches. So sorry, he wasn't a GI. He was an American fighting for the British. And this is what he, what he wrote. We had a new man at the periscope. On this afternoon in question, I was sitting at the, on the fire step, cleaning my rifle. When he called out to me, there's a sort of greenish yellow crowd cloud rolling along the ground in front. It's coming. But I waited for no more, grabbing my bayonet, which was detached from the rifle. I gave the alarm by banging an empty shell case, which was hanging near the periscope. At the same time, gongs started ringing down the trench. The signal for Tommy to don his respirator, or smoke helmet, as we call it. Gas travels quietly, so you must not lose any time. You generally have about 18 or 20 seconds in which to adjust your gas helmet. For a minute, pandemonium ran in our trench. Tommies adjusting their helmets, bombers running here and there, and men turning out in the dugouts with fixed bayonets to man the fire step. Reinforcements were pouring out of the communication trenches. Our guns crew was busy mounting the machine gun on the parapet and bringing up extra ammunition from the dugouts. German gas is heavier than air and soon fills the trenches and dugouts where it has been known to lurk for two or three days until the air is purified by means of large chemical sprayers. We had to work quickly as Fritz generally follows the gas with an infantry attack. A company man on our right was too slow getting on his helmet. He sank to the ground, clutching at his throat. And after a few spasmodic twistings, went west. He died. It was horrible to see him die, but we were powerless to help him. In the corner of a traverse, a little muddy cur dog, one of the company's pets, was lying dead with his two paws over his nose. It's the animals that suffer the most, the horses, the mules, the cattle, dogs, cats, and rats. They having no helmets to save them. Tommy does not sympathize with the rats in the gas attack. At times, gas has been known to travel with dire results 15 miles behind the lines. The attack had been repulsed after a hard fright, fight. Twice the Germans had gained a foothold in our trench, but it had been driven out by counterattacks. The trench was filled with their dead and ours. Through a periscope, I counted 18 dead Germans in our wire. They were a ghastly sight and the horrible looking respirators. Here are some propaganda war posters put out by various nations. This one put out by the United States. Join the US Army, enlist in the US Army. Here's a German. A German coming to carry away American women. You better enlist before he comes and takes away your mom, your sister, your wife, your girlfriend. Uncle Sam. I want you for the US Army, 1917, by James Montgomery Flagg. Here's a German recruitment poster. <laughs> it, looks, looks, it looks sinister, doesn't it? Supply rabbit furs to Dealers and Breeding Association. The army needs them. This is a, a German poster asking German, Germans to donate the rabbit furs for the war effort. Here's another German propaganda poster. Um, good books, good comrades. You too give often and of many kinds. May a good book always be at hand. That's interesting one, isn't it? Interesting insight.
Can you imagine Germans carrying books and reading them in the trenches during this horrible, horrible battle and war? Here's a British poster. Britain needs you at once. And here's St. George fighting a dragon. 1915 recruitment poster. Another is an Australian recruitment poster. All eligible men will first you see in red, right? Free trip to Europe. Invitations issued today. Go to Europe. Free trip. But we read the fine points. All eligible men will be given free clothing, food, money, steamer, and trade accommodation and a trip full of adventure and interest, forming the greatest event of their lives to do their duty at the place where every fit Australian should be, standing shoulder to shoulder with his present defenders in Europe. Invitations in themselves, diplomas of honor forever will be issued and comradeship established today on application to any recruiting officer. Um, this is a repeat of my previous one. Here is another eyewitness account. of a German soldier, from a, a young German perspective. A young man, Stefan Westmann, pictured here. This is, a, this is him later in life. One day we got orders to storm a French position. We got in and my comrades fell right and left of me. But then I was confronted by a French corporal. He had his bayonet at the ready and then my bayonet at the ready. For a moment, I felt the fear of death. And in a fraction of a second, I realized that he was after my life exactly as I was after his. I was quicker than he was. I tossed his rifle away and I ran my bayonet through his chest. He fell, put his hand on the place where I had hit him and then I thrust again. Blood came out of his mouth and he died. I felt physically ill and nearly vomited. My knees were shaking and I was quite frankly ashamed of myself. My comrades, I was a corporal there then, were absolutely undisturbed by what had happened. One of them boasted that he had killed a poilu with the butt of his rifle. Another one had strangled a captain, a French captain. A third one they had hit somebody over the head with his spade and they were ordinary men like me. One of them was a tram conductor. Another one, a commercial traveler. Two were students, the rest were farm workers. Ordinary people who would never would have thought to do any harm to anyone. How did it come about that they were so cruel? I remembered that then that we were told that the good soldier kills without thinking of his adversary as a human being. The very moment he sees in him a fellow man, he is not a good soldier anymore. But I had in front of me the dead man, the dead French soldier, and how would I liked him to have raised his hand. I would have shaken his hand and we would have been the best of friends because he was nothing like me, but a poor boy who had to fight, who had to go in with the most cruel weapons against a man who had nothing against him personally, who only wore the uniform of another nation, who spoke another language, but a man who had a father and a mother and a family, perhaps, and so I felt. I woke up at night, sometimes drenched in sweat because I saw the eyes of my fallen adversary, of the enemy. And I tried to convince myself what would have happened to me if I wouldn't have been quicker than he. What would have happened to me if I wouldn't have thrust my bayonet first into his belly? What was it that we soldiers stabbed each other, strangled each other, went for each other like mad dogs. What was it that we who had nothing against them personally fought with them to the very end in death? We were civilized people after all, but I felt that the culture we boasted so much about is only a very thin lacquer 
which chipped off the very moment we came in contact with cruel things like real war. To fire at each other from a distance, to drop bombs is something impersonal, but to see each other's white in the eyes and then to run with a bayonet against a man, it was against my conception and against my inner feeling. Well, that concludes our lecture on World War I, a few major points and a couple of original sources.